DCI Music Video, the leader in music instruction and the first company to release instructional music video, brings you the best. I like the part about playing a little phrase and then leaving space, and I can hear the, hear what the how the drums would fill that in. yell at everybody every time you say something so sometimes you uh, if you did you frighten them I think the same thing musically DCI Music Video, the first in instructional music video. We set the standard.
Hi, I'm Eric Marienthal, and welcome to Modern Saxophone. You know, playing the saxophone can be one of the most fun instruments you can play, and obviously, the better you are at it, the more fun you're going to have. To me, the two most important things about playing are, number one, having a good, strong sound, and also having good, solid technique. These two points I'm going to cover today extensively, in addition to playing high notes, um, jazz improvisation over various styles of music, and some ear training. So, let's get started. As I was saying before, one of the most important things about playing the saxophone is your tone. Um, it's the greatest asset you'll ever have. Uh, to me, it's the most important thing. And there's a theory I'd like to pass on to you that I have about embouchure and your throat position and diaphragm. Let's start with the embouchure. Remember that it's important to make sure that your whole embouchure is as relaxed as possible. In fact, the only part of the embouchure that needs to be somewhat firm against the bottom teeth is the point of the bottom lip that actually touches the reed. So let me start off with an exercise here that deals with the lower structure here. What we want to do is create a sound. Actually, we'll start on G. And um, we'll play this note. And as you, play, as you play, bring your jaw down slowly until the sound drops out entirely, like this. As you noticed, as I brought the tone down, I lowered my jaw, relaxed it more and more until the sound dropped out entirely. There's a threshold point right there, and just above that point is where you want to have your sound um, develop. That's where you want to basically anchor uh, your bottom lip. So the idea is to allow the reed to vibrate as freely as possible. In fact, all these embouchure exercises that I'm going to give you all relate to the reed, basically, and trying, you want to try to be as um, relaxed with it and um, allow it to vibrate as much as you can. Um, by doing so, your sound will, will be as big as possible. So let's try that exercise again together. And this time, uh, as we play, you're, you're going to play on the note G on the alto. And if you're playing tenor or soprano, go ahead and play along if you want to, or just watch, or turn off your VCR and, and uh, do it on your own. As we play, I'll bring the note, I'll bring my um, lower lip down. And just before I get to the point where the sound's going to drop out, let's see if we can center our sound at that, at that point. <laughs> Now you'll notice that just at that point, the sound sounds quite a bit flatter and kind of, re kind of relaxed, kind of uh, unsupported. The idea is that now that we're lacking all the support with your lower lip and lower teeth, lower jaw, um, you want to support that now with more pressure from your diaphragm. So all the support now, or most of the support anyway, is going to come from uh, your diaphragm in the air as opposed to just biting on the bottom of your mouthpiece. So let's try now to do the same process, except this time try to round out your sound as you get to that point there at just above that uh, cutoff threshold and see if you can really um, develop your sound into a more round sound and try to hear some more of the overtones as you play. <laughs> So this is actually kind of the beginning of a uh, long tone exercise. Uh, so I would say it would be a good idea to, to play this note and some other neighboring tones uh, for eight beats. And as you do them, actually start off first by doing this little exercise that I've done, just to set your lower lip um, just, again, nice and relaxed, as relaxed as possible, actually, and make up all that support with your diaphragm. So. Uh, let's try um, some long tones, and um, we'll play that, uh, that pitch and develop the sound as much as we can. Okay, let's move on now to the upper half of the embouchure, uh, the upper teeth and the upper lip. Um, most importantly, you don't want to be biting too hard on the top of the mouthpiece, or do you want to be um, pushing down 
uh, from your upper lip down onto the mouthpiece. Obviously, as we bring your lower embouchure down, and as we get, uh, get a little bit more relaxed uh, and away from the reed, allowing the reed to vibrate, if we're pushing down from the top, it's going to defeat our purpose. So let me give you an exercise now that will help counter the natural muscles that you have that are kind of naturally pressing down on the top of the mouthpiece. This is kind of a, uh, a strange little exercise. It's kind of called the, uh, the buck tooth exercise, um, where you want to play, again, some long tones. But as you play, try to lift your upper lip off the mouthpiece entirely. So you're playing uh, with your teeth showing like this. As strange as that looks, it's a good exercise because you're countering, again, the muscles um, that are naturally wanting to go down and you're developing some, some that are trying to go up. Um, so try that on long tones uh, for quite a while. I've been practicing it for a while and it comes fairly easily for me, but, and it may for you as well. But uh, if not, um, get in front of a mirror and, and um, give it a try. And, and, uh. Also, another uh, important point is that by doing this, you're also helping your air to um, center itself uh, straight into the mouthpiece. A lot of times when you do this exercise, when you first start out, suddenly you'll lose a lot of air. Air will be escaping all over the place. So try with the shape of your throat and the back of your mouth to zero that air right in to the, um, to the mouthpiece. So let's try that one more time. If you're having a hard time getting this one, um, what I suggest is getting in front of a mirror, like I said before, and just taking your, take your um, finger and actually lift your lip off the mouthpiece and just uh, practice it. I'd recommend um, giving it maybe 15 minutes a day or so, any more than that, and you're likely to uh, be passing out. So give it a try. I bet you like this one. The next point to cover is your throat. It's important to make sure that your throat is as open as possible. Um, your throat is basically the connection between the air, which originates from the diaphragm, and your embouchure, which designates the, the air and, and puts it through the horn. Um, if your throat is closed, then you're going to be cutting off the amount of air coming from your diaphragm and your sound is going to be smaller. Um, one little exercise you can think about is uh, something I call a yawning exercise, where when you yawn, your throat opens as much as it possibly can, and you get this real wide, cavernous feeling. Um, so try to yawn, and as you do that, capture that feeling that you have um, as your throat widens. That is really the optimum position to have your throat uh, inside uh, while you're playing. So let me, let me try to uh, do a little demonstration by playing, and I'll start off with my throat a little bit closed, and the sound will be a bit uh, constricted. and then. As I, uh, as I play, um, I'm going to open my throat more and more and see if you can notice the difference. As you can hear, as I open my throat, it allows more air to come through from the diaphragm and the sound widens. It's actually kind of a feeling right here behind your Adam's apple and along the sides. So that's definitely an important um, point that you want to be thinking about all the time while you're playing. The final point I want to cover as far as tone projection goes is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is where all the air that supports your sound comes from. So naturally, it's the most important element in constructing your sound. The common mistake is to not support from your diaphragm uh, rather, support from your chest. A lot of times your air just sort of um, slowly comes from the diaphragm and you're really kind of pushing from the chest. So let me, uh, let me illustrate one point um, by playing a couple notes. First, I'm going to play a note and just have the air supporting just sort of from, from the chest here. By doing that, your sound is, is constricted and small. What you really want to do is always be pushing from your diaphragm. Really give a good, strong support, like this. You really 
want to have that sound really full and big. It's not to say that you, by supporting, um, you're automatically going to get louder. The idea is that you want to have the volume of air large, but you control your, your actual dynamics, your volume, by the rate of air. And so you always want to have the support, even when you're playing soft, but uh, you just want to slow the air down. So, uh, Let me show you a little exercise here with a piece of paper uh, that you might want to try at home. And um, the idea is to hold the paper up and just blow and try to keep a steady stream of air uh, going onto the paper um, and try to hold, hold it up without letting it down and support your, your uh, stream with your diaphragm, really push from your stomach. Well, it might look a little silly. <laughs> And if you do it too many times, you might pass out from that too. But it really is a good exercise, and, and it helps you develop that strength you need from, um, from your stomach, from your diaphragm. Here's an exercise that I'd like to give to you that I practice every day, and I feel it's a great practice tool. It's called the ascending and descending chromatic exercise. Actually, originally, it was a flute exercise, and you may have played it on the flute uh, yourself, but it translates to saxophone very, very well. Let me describe what it is. Basically, it's just uh, a chromatic scale going up and down uh, with every other note returning to the tonic. So let me demonstrate the scale for you. Oh, I'd like to now mention also that um, I'm going to play this exercise with a drum machine, actually. Um, either practicing with a drum machine or a metronome is very, very important, both as a practicing tool to to even out your technique and make sure you're really locking into the time. Um, by doing that with every note, you're you're really gaining control over your fingers and where and exactly when you're pressing them down. Um, also, it just improves your time sense when it comes time to playing with other musicians, rhythm sections, and impro improvising. Um, it's invaluable to have good, strong, solid time and to be able to lock in to a, uh, to a metronome or to a drummer. So, with the aid of this drum machine here, let me demonstrate this exercise starting from uh, low G going up to uh, middle G. Okay, um, so the idea actually is to start as low as you can, start at the very bottom of the horn on B flat and go on up. Uh, play each one a few times and keep the metronome going and go up the horn chromatically. Uh, to B, C, and all the way up to F. So when you reach that point, you turn back around and start descending. Uh, starting on F, except this time you're going down and every other note is the top F. Let me demonstrate that. And you work your way down the horn until you get down to B flat again. If you do each of those twice and at a moderate uh, tempo, like I just did, uh, and without stopping, it should probably take you maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, one great piece of advice about practicing, too, is that you can consider it um, like, like weightlifting, like exercise, actual physical exercise. And if you maintain um, like a steady flow of exercise, if you keep playing, just like riding a bike or jogging, uh, you're developing muscles, and that's what physically playing um, a saxophone or any wind instrument, any instrument for that matter, um, is all about. You want to develop muscles so that um, you're able to play it more easily. So um, the tempo is definitely your choice, but I'd say never play the exercise any faster, for sure not any faster, than what feels comfortable. Um, a big secret about technique, and especially how to, uh, playing fast, is that is practicing slowly. I definitely feel that when I am at my best technically, I've um, practiced a lot, uh, just very, very slowly, and I feel like I can, I can uh, really move around the horn the best uh, if I've practiced that way. So let me demonstrate one uh, twice that fast for you here. Another 
another thing too about this exercise that you can incorporate is um, various types of articulation. Um, you can do one series uh, slurring the whole way through, then you can do some mixing up the articulation, say uh, uh, slurring to and articulating to, or you can staccato the entire exercise, or you can um, use like a jazz tonguing, like um, tonguing every other note, such as this. <laughs> Or, like I say, like staccato. I feel that that exercise is real strong, and if you spend um, a good 15-20 minutes a day starting from the very bottom of the horn, going up, and going back down, um, you'll really feel a difference. Now here's an exercise that's actually going to require a little bit of homework on your part. It's called the motif exercise. And what you want to do is construct uh, a little musical motif, say uh, four, six, seven notes actually, and um, write them down and practice them just in a repeated fashion. Uh, and ideally what you want to do is find a spot on your horn that you feel like you're a little um, technically lacking. Say if you uh, feel as though um, well, when you play a B major scale, uh, your alternate uh, A sharp fingering down here is a little sluggish and you're, and you're uh, kind of having a hard time with it. Uh, develop a little four note, say, uh, exercise uh, around that fingering. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you write down, say, you know, a whole page worth, say 50 exercises, and um, put repeat marks after each one, and read it down from top to bottom, uh, you'll find that it makes a terrific series of exercises. And much like the chromatic ex exercise we did before, um, if you can go from top to bottom with a minimal number of stops and, and uh, interruptions, uh, you'll find that it's a great technical technique builder. So um, let's give this one over here that I've written down a shot, and I'll show you uh, what I mean. I had a flute teacher back in Berkeley, and he taught me a, a, a great little breathing uh, idea. And that is to make sure that when you play an exercise like that, that requires um, a long breath, a long phrase, to prepare your air. Um, believe it or not, it makes quite a difference if you uh, take a breath of air and then hold it for just a slight second, maybe a quarter of a second, half a second. Just hold it there, and it kind of, um, I don't know, helps set your diaphragm um, in place. I don't know what it is, but it really helps um, when you want to play phrases longer, to take a good breath and then wait just a moment before you start playing. Now let me try this exercise that I wrote down. It deals in some wider intervals. Again, on these exercises, you can um, use all kinds of different articulations, and uh, if you're having trouble, like I say, with keeping an even staccato or, um, or alternating um, short notes to long notes. Now let me give you this exercise here. Just another idea of uh, another pattern that involves uh, going over the uh, octave break. <laughs> Um, one idea also is that you can um, do different kinds of metric practicing. You can uh, play half the exercise slow like that, and the other half twice as fast. Now here's some footage from a Chicory Electric Band concert. It's a solo of mine that I played on the song Light Years, and after we watch it, I'm going to discuss the solo. <laughs>
idea behind playing high notes is to make sure that the note is supported with your air, with your diaphragm, and not uh, achieved by biting down harder on your lip to go higher and higher on the horn. If you do that, number one, your sound will get small and squeaky and really not uh, big and fat like you want. And number two, you're going to end up with an incredibly sore lip after about five minutes. So first, let's start off with some fingerings that I use uh, above F sharp. This first circle up here represents the plateau key. These three right here represent one, two, and three on the left hand. These are one, two, and three on the right hand. This is your C and E flat keys down here with the pinky of the right hand. This is the octave key here. These are the table keys, and up here are the palm keys. My fingering for F sharp is a typical fingering um, of the uh, plateau key, the C key, the middle key down here, uh, the octave key, and the side B flat. That one comes out awfully nicely, and, and if you haven't got um, a higher sharp key on your saxophone, um, that's a great alternative fingering. Let me move on now <coughs> to the G fingering, which is uh, one and three on the left hand, one and three in the right hand, and the octave key. The next fingering is the A flat or the uh, G-sharp fingering. Same as G, except you just add the side C right over here to the same fingering, and it pops out pretty nicely. Okay, moving on to high A. Um, high A for me uh, works two different ways, but the fingering I prefer is this one here, of just two and three in the left hand and the octave key. Sounds like this. Another way to finger that same note is to bring down the